Welcome to a lecture on numerical acoustics. My name's Bill Anderson, and I'm a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. My background has been in structural dynamics, including uh, flutter, which is aeroelasticity, and involves the fluid flow over elastic bodies. It's somewhat of a related field to numerical acoustics in that uh, I've spent my life doing numerical methods on various vibrating bodies, and of course that's a typical source of acoustic noise, so it's a rather natural progression now to move into the area of acoustics. Acoustics is really becoming important to the average engineer and scientist. There's so many situations where you need to understand sound, its generation, its propagation, and its reception by human ears. The first lecture that I'll give is a little bit um, detailed in that there are a lot of topics on this introductory page. I'll give a little bit on the history of acoustics. I'll follow with the idea of how sound is generated, propagated, and received. Then I'll do a little bit of the uh, background on what sound waves are. For instance, Sound waves are compressional waves. They're uh, uh, represented by a scalar field, unlike the electromagnetic waves, which uh, can be polarized and are more complicated. Those are transverse waves. So sound waves are uh, compressions and rarefactions that progress along a line and uh, in that sense are like axial vibrations of a rod rather than lateral vibrations of a rod, if I use a structural equivalent. Um, I will talk about some uh, theoretical things that I've uh, been aware of in the past, such as the pressure on a piston face and the linear piston theory. Uh, then I'll try to do some slides that are on uh, gross comparisons between acoustics and uh, some other fields that are fluid fields, such as hydrodynamics, uh, wing theory, and then the piston theory. Before I do that first, um, introductory uh, slide though, I'm going to say a little bit about my own background and my own uh, professional career. I graduated from Caltech July of 1962 with a degree in aeronautics. I was in the aeroelasticity group which is basically more embedded in structural mechanics than fluids. Um, typically unsteady aerodynamics has been studied that way, surprisingly, in groups that are not the conventional fluid mechanics groups. From that standpoint, my fluids background is a little different and maybe a little more elementary than many fluids people uh, that would be viewing this set of uh, lectures. That might be good for you because I'm going to approach the material as a novice in, from the fluid standpoint and so hopefully can bring a wide variety of people up to some level of understanding on, on what the numerical acoustics means and the, the equations on which it's based. Um, I spent three years at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, uh, worked on aeroelasticity, wind tunnel flow over wavy walls. Then I came to the University of Michigan in 1965 and I've been here since. So I'm currently completing my 30th year at the University of Michigan. About 12 years ago I founded a consulting company, Automated Analysis Corporation, and this has been the focus of my professional life recently in terms of cons consultation and uh, going into some new ventures. The multimedia discs that you are viewing here have been created under the sponsorship of Automated Analysis. Probably the greatest researcher of all times in acoustics was Lord Rayleigh. His real name was John William Strutt and he inherited his title from his father. This was a good thing for him. It gave him enough wealth to pursue his interest in acoustics. One story is that he did a good part of his serious work when he was floating down the Nile on a barge after recovering from some malady of the time and uh, was able with the peace and quiet to get a lot of work done. He published the Theory of Sound, which is considered the greatest work in acoustics, back in 1877. So it's a little bit humbling to see that so much of the uh, theory of acoustics was understood by someone uh, more than a century ago. Acoustics is basically divided into three physical phenomena. The first is the production of sound. 
And here I'm illustrating a solid body that is vibrating and sending out noise. This production of sound could equally well be done by instabilities in fluid, such as boundary layer noise or uh, instability in uh, turbulent jets. And that particular specialty area is called aeroacoustics. We won't really get into that much. Uh, rather, we're going to think of the production of sound as occurring off of typically a wall that is having a certain velocity or a known pressure distribution on a surface. The aeroacoustic problem could be considered here in the sense that if it could be converted into uh, a proper boundary condition for our field equation, then we can handle it. And, and that is possible in a number of cases. But the actual generation of sound within fluids by instabilities is a very, very difficult topic right now. Once the sound is generated either by a mechanical solid source or by some fluid um, oscillation, then it propagates through the open medium. The most typical media, of course, are air or water. The study that we do in our numerical acoustics is primarily then to look at the propagation of this sound as it moves in space and to observe how it interacts with boundaries and with obstacles. Um, at times we have closed cavities and we're interested in the normal modes of the closed cavities. The interaction at those walls and with bodies is important. Uh, an important um, concept there is the so-called impedance of the surface that it is uh, coming in contact with. And so there are sound absorbing surfaces, there are sound reflecting surfaces. Those are considered boundary conditions in our field problem. The field equation is now called the Helmholtz equation. Finally, this uh, sound is received by a human ear and there's quite a physiological component here uh, in terms of what uh, the human perceives to be good noise, bad noise, and uh, friendly, unfriendly, and so on. This has to do with details of the frequency range, the intensity of the sound, uh, and the quality in, in sort of uh, uh, physiological senses. So we still today are uh, learning what it means for the ear to receive sound and either be pleased or disappointed in it. Now let's look at the production of sound uh, as generally produced by solid bodies in this case. We'll concentrate on that rather than aeroacoustics. And I'll follow a historical introduction done in the theory of sound. Um, you can look that up. It's a very interesting uh, reading and I'll give the reference on our title page. Pythagoras back in the 6th century BC understood that if you had a stretched string and you plucked it that the shorter strings would give a higher pitch. And so um, probably at that time they didn't understand the concept of tension in the string also affecting things and that was un uncovered later on. But certainly uh, Pythagoras got the right idea some um, 2600 years ago. Mersenne, a um, French uh, person, understood the frequencies of strings, including the effect of tension. And so this was some good, oh, 2,200 years later. So people, people were probably playing musical instruments all during that time, lyres and, and uh, violins and so on, and, and were just uh, barely able to understand the cause and effect. Now, I presume that the good violin makers really knew this in instinctively and did the right thing, of course. But Marsan found uh, a simple mathematical relation. Galileo who uh, has been known uh, for a number of things, celestial ob observations and so on, often stemming from his ability to make magnifying glasses, uh, used such an instrument to look at the effect on steel when someone had hammered a chisel and, uh, on that steel. And he heard this vibrating note 
and realize there's something musical about it. And you may have heard that yourself if you hear people uh, pounding on steel in one way or another, and more than the ring of the blacksmith's hammer, but if, the, but if the blacksmith has a chisel, you get a kind of a clear ringing note. And Galileo looked at that and saw small um, serrated uh, uh, riffles in the steel, and he was able to relate then the um, the frequency of vibration with those wavelengths carved into the steel. I think in modern times something like the squeal of brakes on a, on a heavy bus going by might be a comparable modern phenomenon. Bernoulli, 1755, understood how sound was a superposition of uh, small oscillations at different frequencies. He really understood completely this process uh, so much that it's a wonder we don't call these series of sine functions to be Bernoulli's series. But Fourier came along a little bit later and did a little better mathematical job on it. And so today we really talk about Fourier series when we speak about superposition of uh, multiple sine waves adding up to some sort of a, a sensible, uh, that is, an observable result. A major step forward in the understanding of the production of sound occurred in the 1700s and 1800s as the mathematicians and physicists learned to study the vibration of bars and plates. Plates are um, a very efficient uh, generator of sound because they have a broad surface to move air as they vibrate laterally. Euler and Bernoulli, more than 200 years ago, understood the vibration of bars, the lateral vibration. The theory today is still known as Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, and uh, I teach it almost every day at the university. Lagrange found theoretical frequencies for the cavity of an organ pipe, often open at one end. Chladni uh, was able to visualize the stationary lines on a vibrating plate-like body by using cork dust, which would migrate to the stationary portions of the plate. I've done this myself with salt on a black background, and it works beautifully. Um, I will often call this line a Chladni nodal line to distinguish it from the nodes that we speak of in finite elements. Sophie Saint-Germain was a noted French physicist. Uh, in response to a competition by Napoleon, she developed the fourth order differential equations for plate vibration. Napoleon was very interested in building good plate-like structures and was interested in the vibration of bridges and other military uh, necessities. But uh, Saint-Germain worked from equilibrium ideas and didn't come up with quite the right boundary conditions, which was left for Kirchhoff at a little later time uh, using the calculus of variations and energy ideas and found the proper plate boundary conditions, which are not trivial for the free edge. Poisson uh, solved the membrane vibration problem and Klebisch worked with the circular membrane, and that's, of course, still important today in, in various sound generation situations. I guess a, uh, a kettle drum would be a typical circular membrane that is uh, rather pleasing to hear. Let's now look at the propagation of sound. This is our major topic of interest in this lecture series. If we go back historically to the days of Aristotle, it was thought that the air had to move in order to uh, allow the sound to travel from a sender to a receiver. Gassendi in 1635 uh, decided that this was true as well that, and proposed that there was a fine stream of particles that had to move through the air in order to hear it. Um, that was not true, of course, but in modern times we can't be too critical because it turns out that is the way that light travels through small packets of energy called photons that really do go from the light source to the light receiver. Gassendi did correctly realize, though, that the speed of sound was not a function of the 
tone, that is the frequency of sound. Early experiments had to do with shooting of cannons and flashing lights and measuring the travel of sound over relatively large distances so that the inaccuracies in their measuring equipment didn't dominate the resulting speed. They got a value of 350 meters per second, which is not that far off from modern values used, such as 343 meters per second at room temperature. Boyle, in 1660, uh, observed that the medium, say, air, was necessary to transport the sound, and he did it by putting an alarm clock in a vacuum bell. Then he evacuated the air from the bell and let the alarm clock ring. He had a false start on this, apparently, where at first he had the alarm clock sitting on the bottom of the vacuum bell, and the sound was still heard through the structural path. Then later he realized he had to isolate the alarm clock and get it up in the air on unsuitable foam or whatever. And then he found, indeed, the alarm clock couldn't be heard. So that was quite a step forward. Von Gerke, 1686, doubted that the air had to move uh, in the large as a stream of air. And so he was on the right track. Another measurement of the speed of sound was done by the Academy of Science in Paris, 1738. And they got a, a little lower number, which was probably more accurate considering the uh, temperature that they were measuring it at. Uh, most of these experiments had to do with a loud noise like a cannon or a gun and then a, and a flash of light and uh, basically assuming that the speed of light is infinite, they were able to find the time duration of the uh, sound impulse from point A to point B and they did it over rather long distances because of the lack of accurate uh, time measuring devices. Laplace was the first person to understand that the propagation of sound waves through a medium is adiabatic. Now that means that there's um, not heat conduction taking place along the wavelength such that you can uh, equalize the hot and cold temperatures. You see where the fluid is compressed, it would naturally be warmer. Where it was expanded, it would be naturally cooler. The question is, if the uh, process was slow enough in some sense, or the wavelengths were short enough to allow shorter conduction paths, then maybe the uh, propagation would occur at a constant temperature. It's found that that's not true. I'll talk about that later. And it has more to do with the wavelengths, that there's um, uh, uh, even low frequencies uh, have such long wavelengths that it's too large a distance for the temperature to equalize. Uh, he also came up with the speed of sound then as square root of gamma RT. So we see that temperature is, is the driving parameter behind the speed of sound. Now let's go on to the reception of sound, which I've said is more of a physiological thing. People have always been interested in, in that because of deafness of humans. And um, some of the early uh, studies were, did revolve about that sort of concern. Kircher in 1650 realized that if you took a megaphone and stuck it in your ear, it acted as a, an amplifier of sound, and you had a, uh, a hearing trumpet. Uh, makes you wonder if there wasn't somebody in, in some military marching band that didn't do the same thing at some point and stick his trumpet in his ear and uh, realize he could hear the enemy talking or something like this. Savart, very famous person in fluid mechanics, um, tried to determine the range of audibility for humans and came up with numbers that are a little bit too broad saying that humans can hear from 8 to 24,000 hertz. Not true. Humans really can't get down much below 15. And on the top end, much above 15,000. Um, the television screech is somewhere around 16,000. It has to do with the horizontal um, uh, um, 
signal as it's displayed on the screen and then the electronics that drive that. That used to really be hard on me when I was younger because I could hear that frequency and sometimes I literally couldn't be in the same room as, uh, as poorly made television sets. Uh, that's one of the advantages of advancing age. You lose that ability. You can't hear that TV squeal as you get older. Now, uh, this group of fellows, very famous fellows, um, decided that the audible range at the lower end was more 16 to 32 hertz. And uh, so you see, depending how they did their measurements, their human subjects, and depending how they measured uh, frequency, they were getting slightly different results. The next figure continues this historical review about reception. Topler, Boltzmann, and Raleigh were all interested in the minimum audible amplitude. And uh, we're going to show you the full range of human hearing um, in a few slides later. So these people were interested in the lower boundary of such a figure where uh, if you plot frequency on the horizontal axis and some sound level, say, in decibels on the vertical axis. Then there is a curve here um, above which sound pressure levels must exist in order for humans to hear it. Ohm developed his law of audition, and for the reception of sound, this would be comparable to Bernoulli's ideas about the creation of sound and the superposition, uh, and Fourier's ideas about heat conduction and how you can break um, temperature fields into these harmonic uh, functions. Upham got into architectural acoustics, and these last three have to do with that. It's been known for a long time that large buildings have special problems. It involves a lot of reflection of sound. Today, these problems are generally handled by methods called ray tracing, and rather than solving the field equation such as we will do. The reason is there's so much detail in a large auditorium with so many seats and wall conditions and uh, nooks and crannies that it's difficult to do a full field solution. It would be too expensive. Henry has carried this further into qualitative understanding and Sabine into the quantitative um, logic. But, you know, even today, large auditoria are constructed and found to have very poor qualities in terms of uh, music productions. We find that in Detroit there was a, an auditorium made in recent times that had to be retrofitted at great expense to try to make it uh, musically okay. Yeah, I think even just to reach an okay level. So obviously the uh, Acoustics of large auditoria are not fully uh, technically handled right now. Let's talk a bit now about the more physical nature of acoustic waves. Sound waves are traveling waves. They're harmonic oscillations of the various parameters, pressure, temperature, density, in a medium. And so sound tends to move along a straight line unless it's uh, affected by one of these processes below here. But generally speaking, propagates along a straight line and is a succession of uh, compressions and rarefactions and more compressions and so on. But these, these points tend to move. And there is a, a wave velocity that's associated with that uh, pressure disturbance. Often pressure is viewed as the driving uh, quantity. In fact, we're going to find in our field equations ultimately that you generally try to eliminate temperature and density variations in terms of pressure. So if you do use what are sometimes called primitive variables, the true physical variables, rather than potential functions and so on, you find that pressure is usually the variable that's used to characterize the sound field. Now, 
you probably have a, a feeling for reflection off of a wall. If it were a perfectly reflecting hard wall, then you'd get the energy bounce back again. At the other uh, extreme, you have absorption, and that would be where a sound wave in principle might come into a wall and not be reflected at all. So that would be a perfect absorber. Then these intermediate terms have to do with uh, interaction between a wave and a body, or in the case of interference, you've got, inter uh, you've got the interaction between two waves. Um, I won't go into these in detail. I think I would refer you to the book by uh, Leo Baranek, and I'll give the, um, uh, on the title page, I'll give that as a uh, reference. One thing that's kind of uh, interesting is that the sound waves can't be polarized. You know how that's done with light waves. Uh, for instance, when you wear polarized glasses at the beach, you want to have a vertical plane of uh, polarization so that you don't get the horizontal waves coming through. And sound cannot be polarized in that way. Sound is a, uh, a compressional wave and not a, a lateral wave. But, of course, the various electromagnetic waves, uh, not only uh, light, but um, other such waves, microwaves and so on, are uh, polarizable. I'd like to make some comments about uh, some of the practical side of sound and how you might measure the intensity of sound. Uh, we can characterize sound waves by the wave speed, the wavelength, the frequency, and the amplitude. And uh, th there are relations, of course, between uh, the wave speed, the length, and the frequency because of the constant speed of sound. The uh, amplitude is a very important measure. This would be, could be measured typically as a pressure amplitude. And there are a number of different uh, ways to measure it and interpret the uh, sound level. First of all, I want to repeat that idea that uh, your ear is quite adept at hearing pressure waves that are less than a thousandth of an atmosphere. And that means that the linear theories really do apply. It makes it somewhat reminiscent of linear elasticity or the infinitesimal elasticity theories, which are quite accurate for solid bodies. And the same thing is true here, that the, the differential equation there, therefore, that uh, applies to acoustics, which is the Helmholtz equation, uh, is really rather accurate. And the problem is not so much in the field equation, but rather putting the proper boundary conditions on and, and other sorts of constraints. Now, I'll go through some of the ways that we can measure the sound amplitude on the following slides. One of the most commonly used measurements for sound intensity is the sound pressure level. This is a logarithmic ratio of pressures and uh, has the 20 out front and the log to the base 10 is used. The reference pressure is quite small. Indeed, for air, it's only 20 micropascals. Pierce mentions in his book that in liquids, it's common to use one micropascal as a reference pressure. The range of audibility for humans is really broad. It's something that's um, uh, astounding, in fact, and that's what requires this logarithmic scale. Humans. Uh, audibility range goes from 0 decibels up to 130 or so where it becomes painful. The pressures involved therefore range from the reference pressure where the logarithm is 0 of 20 micropascals up to the 130 decibel level where I've calculated that that is less than a thousandth of an atmosphere in terms of the RMS oscillating pressure. So isn't it interesting that your ear is so sensitive that it can hear um, uh, noises that are a thousandth or a millionth of an atmosphere uh, oscillating? And even when you get up to a thousandth, then you're um, overloading the system badly. So sound certainly is a linear process in that sense. Uh, it's a very small perturbation on a rather large mean value of pressure. Um, sound intensity is another way to look at uh, the sound in a terms of a uh, energy basis. And this has to do with the rate at which sound is transmitted through a unit area. Um, and it's given in this form. 
So the dimensions are uh, uh, energy per unit area. Here I'm showing units of watts per meter squared. So I'll continue on the next figure on more uh, measures of sound uh, level. The sound energy density we'll call D and that's the energy per unit volume of a medium and again can be expressed in terms of pressure uh, and the ratio of specific heats here. For a diatomic gas, which air is largely, 1.4 is the proper value. I guess that's because both nitrogen and, um, and oxygen are diatomic, O2 and N2. Another idea is the total radiated power. Sometimes you uh, take a noise source and put it in a room that's a reverberant room uh, which has entirely hard walls and then you find that that noise tends to fill this space and so it's kind of interesting then to see get some measure of what the total radiated power can be. Let's consider now the audibility limits for human hearing. This is rather concisely uh, shown on a single figure. At the lower end, we find that humans are finely tuned to hear frequency ranges in the range of the human speaking uh, tones. So you get this very, very sensitive region where sounds even of zero decibels are uh, possible to be heard. It cuts out at around 15 or 16,000 hertz here, and uh, that is an interesting high end showing that you don't need uh, protection, particularly against higher frequencies. At the low end, we've shown before that there are uh, various measured limits on audibility of, of uh, 15 to, to 20 hertz, and you can imagine then, depending on the individual that was being tested, that that number would vary. At the upper end, you have the threshold of feeling, um, wanders some around 120 decibels. The beginning of pain is somewhere around 130 and certainly very painful at 140 decibels. There's a sketch curve here suggesting that you need protection if you have long-term exposure in these frequency ranges, so various industrial processes might need that. For instance, there is a um, case where you have jackhammers, which might be, uh, let's say, a hundred decibel range, so people operating jackhammers probably should be wearing hearing uh, protection. Rock concerts can get as high as 120 decibels, so they they also look like a bad idea. Metal stamping plants can be as high as 90 decibels, and if you've ever been in a sheet metal stamping plant, you know how pervasive that noise really is. It's hard to concentrate or do any thinking in that much noise. Vacuum cleaners are around 80 decibels, busy traffic at 70, quiet restaurant perhaps at 50, rustling of leaves maybe at 20, and human breathing could be uh, down as much as uh, 10 decibels at 3 meters. I have a friend, Joe Isley, who as a young person drove a tractor a lot, and he developed a notch in his hearing ability where he couldn't hear noises over a certain range. He says now that he has trouble when he attends Shakespearean plays because he's missing some of the uh, hissing sounds, the S's as in forsooth. And uh, so that's kind of an interesting concept that if you ride a tractor a lot when you're a young person, then you don't enjoy Shakespearean plays when you're a little older. When one wants a measurement of sound level, you need to think about how you might emphasize the reading when you've averaged over a broad frequency range. Uh, a purely mechanical approach might be to say that all 
uh, frequency content was the same. But we know now that the human ear doesn't hear as well down at the low or at the high frequencies. Therefore, you might build in some sort of a weighting factor as a function of frequency that would emphasize the uh, mid-frequency range that we can hear and then de-emphasize the frequencies at the tails of our audibility. Such a figure is shown here where there are three proposed scales for uh, measuring sound. The A scale is used most often in the United States uh, with what's called fast time averaging. Uh, the B scale is another physiological scale, but the C scale is one that is flat and is just more of a, a cold uh, uh, measurement of total sound level. I have a story to tell about this, that when I was a young man, uh, some 20 years old, so wow, this would be uh, 30, 37 years ago, uh, in Dallas, Texas, I did some background sound measurements for the Vought Aircraft Company. They were going to build a wind tunnel out on a flat field behind the plant in, in Grand Prairie, Texas. And they wanted the background measurements to see what change the uh, new facility would make. So I found myself one day standing with a uh, sound meter out in the middle of this field and, and watching it. And the scale was, uh, the, the measurement showed rather low sound level. And then all of a sudden it started kicking up. And I couldn't believe it. Quite a lot, something loud was going on, but I couldn't hear it. So obviously I was using something uh, like a C scale in today's uh, discussion. What I found was there was a mourning dove in a tree some uh, couple hundred feet away, and when it cooed, it literally drove this meter berserk, and yet I could barely hear it. It was very low frequency. Yeah, I think you know what a morning dove uh, sounds like. It's quite a low, soft sound. And so that's an example of how you might want to have a weighted scale to more reasonably represent what the human ear hears, not what the true uh, level of sound pressure is on some absolute uh, mechanical scale. So recommended in the US is to use this A scale with what's called fast time averaging. And as you can see, basically, you're, you're um, penalizing the measured sound over most of this range with as much as uh, minus 38 decibels or so, up to where you reach actually a little overshoot and you're enhancing the sound reading in this mid-frequency range. In solving practical acoustics problems, we need the concept of impedance. There are several definitions for it. Some of them are more appropriate for a discrete circuit, where you might have sound being piped around in, in tubes and out horns and things like that. One of the versions is more important for solving field equations, such as we're interested in. In general, impedance is a measure of the resistance the fluid offers against uh, an imposed velocity. So it's a measure of how the fluid does not like to be pushed around. The ASA impedance is a ratio of pressure to volume flow, and that's appropriate for acoustic circuits. And uh, typical units used are these. The specific impedance is the one that we're mostly interested in, and the ratio of pressure to velocity at a point. The specific impedance is often used to characterize the uh, acoustic treatment on a wall, where you may have uh, incoming sound being uh, handled and causing pressures in a certain phase relation at a wall, which might be a partial absorber um, or have other characteristics. Usually the impedance is a complex number in that case. Mechanical impedance, uh, again, possibly used more for circuits, is the ratio of force on some specified area to velocity. And again, useful maybe for mechanical devices. The specific impedance is our um, favorite impedance, and one way to use it is to characterize the fluid going out to infinity, and people talk about far field impedance. Sometimes if you do a finite mesh of a uh, given situation, perhaps you have a body radiating sound and you'd like to terminate the mesh at some radius away from the body, you'd, you'd, be, uh, you'd like to 
terminate the mesh and have the mesh look into the far field with a proper impedance match. That's not done a lot in acoustics. It has been done more in electromagnetics and I got into a uh, dissertation uh, position once as an advisor where we did that and questions of matching your finite field uh, mesh to the far field really were quite important to avoid reflections and so on. So I guess there are those different usages of the uh, impedance, both uh, at a wall, in our case, uh, characterizing something rather local and then trying to match to infinity something called a far field impedance. We'll consider the impedances in more detail now and start with the ASA impedance. It has the definition of pressure over a cross-sectional area and then a velocity. Now both the pressure and the velocity are oscillatory of course. This turns out to be useful for branch circuits that are consisting of tubes say where you're piping sound around in a in a system and it turns out to be useful because you can handle these impedances uh, in a way uh, in branch circuits that makes sense consider this hypothetical case where you have a tube of a given area on the left and then it branches into two tubes each of half the area on the right. It turns out the impedance then for the left here can be calculated as um, matching the impedance of these two on the right and that would be the intent of this circuit to have a match to impedance. The um, calculation on the right here actually follows the way of adding resistors in parallel. Um, were we adding something like a conductance, this would be straightforward in our case, but we're, we're trying to work with impedances and you get this more complicated formula that many of you probably remember from your electrical uh, circuit theory. Well, this, um, this sum here because you have half the area but the same velocities because by conservation of mass flow when, when there's no gross area change then the oscillatory velocity has to remain the same as you progress from left to right through the um, junction then those can be added up and lo and behold we do have a matched impedance case here. So this is a rather special kind of impedance. It's one that we don't really use much in our uh, field representation of sound, however. Now let's look at specific impedance. Uh, this is a useful version to use in three-dimensional boundary value problems such as we do in numerical acoustics. So this is the one we, we're interested in. Um, it's the pressure over the velocity at a point. Uh, it's given the symbol Z sub S because of being specific impedance. The interesting thing is that it's, it's almost the same at all points in a space. You often hear comments like far field impedance and that would be a, an unbounded space going on forever and you get a certain value. But that, it turns out um, on the face of a, a piston, a one-dimensional piston moving in a tube, let's say, that this turns out also to be literally true for that case. Um, the impedance on the face of a one-dimensional piston is, is also this P over V which can be shown to be rho C. And um, so kind of a, an interesting um, concept um, and has an intrinsic meaning and probably one of the um, most used ones is the uh, impedance uh, for the far field which is a measure of the basic, um, oh, the property of the medium itself. The third impedance was mechanical impedance and that's good for uh, systems that are composed of lumped uh, devices, circuit devices. And often you know what the forces are and um, you can calculate then the, the input of, of such a force like a diaphragm in a loudspeaker system illustrated here. This is a physical diagram above uh, here that shows the system of a, of a tube that's open at one end and then some driving force on a diaphragm. 
uh, you might think of the, the driving force itself as being external to the diaphragm and then some sort of mechanical impedance due to the diaphragm itself, which could have the capacitive, inductive, and resistive components. And then the far field uh, out here will be felt, uh, well, probably if you model right to the uh, mouth here, you're going to come up with an air load impedance and that would probably have some end correction for if it were placed right there um, in terms of the uh, shape of the mouth here and whether this had some kind of a rolled edge or whatever. So in this case we're showing a series uh, impedance idea of the uh, mechanical uh, aspects of the diaphragm and then the um, fluid uh, aspects of the air load out here. This time they're adding as if in series. A very important concept in acoustics is that of the pressure on a face of a piston that's moving into the medium. We'd like to look at the one-dimensional example of this, and you can reach that with two limiting cases. One is a very big piston that's moving the entire half space of the uh, fluid medium ahead of it. Uh, or you could take the second case would be a small piston filling a tube, and that's what I illustrate in this next figure. Here you have a piston being driven in the left end of this tube. The air or what other fluid medium is, is being compressed and expanded and so on uh, in the uh, length of the tube. The relevant equation is the wave equation shown here. I'm going to fully drive that later, but presently I'm just going to take about five figures and show how you can characterize the pressure on the face of the piston. And that's very useful later on as a reference pressure for a uh, limiting case for a number of different theories. It turns out it's fairly valid for higher frequencies, even on three-dimensional bodies. And, and it's a rough cut at a lot of different pressures that you might later want to calculate. Um, the boundary condition at the left end uh, would be to match the uh, velocity in the fluid field, call it uh, at point uh, x0 at the face of the piston. So our coordinate system starts right at the piston face here. That's going to be our x coordinate. And then we'll give it the symbol v0 to stand for the time dependence of the piston motion itself in the x direction. Before we calculate the pressure on the piston face, I'll have to go through some mathematical details. This is a little painful, I know. Uh, just see what we can uh, get out of this. Often you'll see a function of a variable where the variable is complex, maybe even related to further variables. If you use the tick mark like that, it's basically a total derivative that uh, you have to take the derivative of the function with respect to whatever lays inside it. Um, that'll come up in a minute. Uh, we also need to know partial derivatives where you're taking a partial derivative with respect to one of the variables occurring in the interior of that function. And that's a chain rule idea where you first take the, uh, this total derivative with respect to the total variable and then you do the partial derivative of the argument with respect to the specific variable you're interested in. That, um, uh, in this case, the quantity up front here is recognizable as what we mean by F prime, and the quantity here is recognizable as just unity because the derivative of x minus c t by dx is just going to be 1. So you come out with this answer. On the other hand, if you want the partial derivative on time, then you'll get this same total derivative here, which we identify as f prime. But then the partial on the time portion of this argument comes out to be a minus c. And so we get just a slight correction now. Now let's get the solution to our pressure on the piston face. I'm going to propose that the wave equation has pressure form of solution shown here, that there's a right traveling wave and a left traveling wave possibly uh, emitted by that piston. 
Uh, these f and g uh, symbols mean arbitrary functions at this point of those time and space variables. But we're only going to consider the disturbance propagating away from the piston face to the right, and that's called the radiation condition. I'm not interested in what goes on at the left, uh, nor incoming waves from infinity. And so, uh, you know, that means we're not interested in reflections from the far end of that uh, little tube. So our pressure field is going to look like this by assumption. Now, we can put that um, assumed uh, form into the momentum balance, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, but here's an equation that shows basically how the, the gradient of the pressure field will cause a change in momentum. So you get the density and then something like acceleration here you see. So we put this in and we end up then um, with a derivative on x is the same as the prime or the total derivative here uh, with respect to the entire argument. The left side here is unchanged. Now let's evaluate this expression at the face of the piston. This is at the point x equals zero. And we now say that the velocity here is the velocity of the moving piston. It could be a function of time. The argument has reduced to minus ct. If I want to replace that derivative with a partial, I have to remember the chain rule that we had worked with before, and that coughs out this uh, constant in the front, giving us a partial on time here. I view this as a little bit of a trick, so if some of you are puzzled by this, I can see why. Now here you've got a uh, situation where there are two terms uh, involved with derivative on time only. Now we can integrate with respect to time. In general, that would bring in an arbitrary function of space then as a uh, constant of integration, but we're not interested in uh, steady uh, pressure fields in space, and so we won't worry about that. Uh, this actually is enough to give you the form of the um, function f of minus ct in terms of the density of the fluid, the velocity, and the speed of sound. And this is, in effect, our pressure expression that we'll uh, complete in the next figure. I think this uh, little proof is going to feel to a lot of people like lifting yourself by your bootstraps. It's sort of as if you assume the answer and then you show you know what the answer is. But uh, it's self-consistent anyway, and it took some uh, you know, malice of forethought to set it up this way. Uh, now the pressure on the face of the piston really is equated to the pressure in the fluid, which we had uh, as our um, uh, F function here was a pressure wave traveling to the right. And so if we set x equals zero in that, it just gives a, um, this um, function at evaluated at minus c uh, t. And uh, that is a pressure on the surface of the piston. So we're matching the fluid wave pressure to the uh, mechanical pressure on the piston itself. And that actually then uh, shows us, since we've already found the form of this uh, F on the previous slide, that the pressure on the face of the piston at x equals zero, and, and it's the same as in the fluid for that matter, um, uh, and for any time is rho v zero uh, c. And so actually this is an unsteady solution that is valid for any instant of time. This uh, piston can be jumping around and oscillating. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a harmonic oscillation. It can be any random motion. And in one dimension, you directly get the pressure to be rho vc. So it's interesting that the acoustic pressure is directly proportional to the piston speed. Now, now that's not obvious, you know, because I work a lot in aeronautics where you have pressure forces like uh, the form drag on bluff bodies and the pressures go like speed squared. Very common. And turbulent flows and things like that often, it's the square of the speed that's relevant. But this is linear acoustics and we kind of luck out that pressure is proportional to the local velocity and, and particularly on the face of the piston. Uh, the speed of sound enters and here we have the density entering. So uh, the medium itself has some effect and as you might imagine, the 
heavier the fluid uh, or the more massive per unit volume, the, the more pressure you get. Uh, the speed of sound's a little more mysterious why it would be, uh, why you would get higher pressures for higher speeds of sound, but that's the way it works out. And I regard this then as kind of a fundamental uh, checking uh, calculation that you can use in other uh, real world situations. We do something like this in structural mechanics if we can refer everything to what a beam would do. And I have one friend who claims he can turn almost any structure into a beam if he tries hard enough. Well, in the like ways you might be able to turn a lot of acoustic problems, uh, surface pressures, into what would happen on the face of a, a piston in one dimension and then realize that that's only a very rough approximation. A good part of my doctoral program at Caltech some uh, 35 years ago had to do with doing flutter calculations at supersonic speeds. And at that time I was impressed with the linear piston theory. I knew that it had acoustic origins um, and we understood how the flow going over a wavy wall uh, acted in, in a, a similar manner to, manner to a piston moving up and down in a small tube. So. I was impressed by that and I thought maybe there are other fluid mechanics people who would like to be reminded about how linear piston theory works supersonically. Even though it's not an acoustic problem per se, it's an analogy, but it's kind of a one that you can get for free with only a couple slides here. So we're now talking not about quiescent air, but rather air that's moving reference to a solid body. And if the body has shallow undulations and there's a, a dominant mean flow here, uh, capital V, then when the wall moves away from the dominant fluid field, uh, you get the flow turning downward and much as if a piston is being pulled away from the flow. In other words, the sense of the, um, uh, the fluid flow is, hey, the, there's a piston there moving downward. Or if you reach an inclined slope in this direction, you get, hey, the fluid feels it's being pushed upward by a piston. In addition, there can be the unsteady motion of the wall itself, which would add indirectly. So uh, this slope-like condition, and you can figure this out in a few minutes if you look at it, involves a vertical contribution of the flow velocity turned through the tangent of the angle, which is the uh, slope here, dw dx, where w is the uh, position of that solid boundary, dividing fluid from solid. And then the unsteady part here would be how the wall itself will have moved in, in time as a particle of fluid goes from this point on to this one. The wall has moved upwards and so really the particle sees this final um, direction of flow which involves both the steady and the unsteady components. Um, so the total vertical velocity, small v, is that uh, shown here of a, uh, of a steady part due to the wall slope and then a, an unsteady part here doing, due to the wall's velocity. I believe Wally Hayes at Princeton University was the first person to point out the usefulness of this acoustic analogy for flutter problems. And we used that uh, method widely at Caltech when I was a graduate student there for quite a range of panel flutter problems, uh, curved panels, flat panels, and so on that were exposed to supersonic flow. The pressure on the wall surface using this piston analogy is rho C V. We interpret the V as the vertical component of velocity that involves this slope term and then this unsteady term. Multiplying that out, uh, some people think of this as an aerodynamic damping. This is a quasi-static force dependent on the instantaneous shape of the body. Other people would like to turn this into a Mach number relation rather than strict velocities and they divide out in getting this form here. People call this linear piston theory and it's used widely in um, not only in research but in some of the commercial codes. I know that in the MSC Nastran code it's used in, uh, as one of the alternatives for uh, flutter calculation for supersonic wings.
One thing that I often like to do is to compare different theories, if you can do that, put them on the same basis and see what they say about a similar simple physical situation. So um, I'm aware that there's a hydrodynamic field, there's a, an acoustic uh, field, there's a linear piston theory, aerodynamics, there's a subsonic wing theory, uh, thin wing theory, and so I was wondering how do these different technologies compare? So I, I wondered if you took a small disc such as this one, and of course acoustics would be uh, air at rest or another medium at rest, but then uh, if this body from the side looked like a slender wing, this disc, but was uh, suspended, let's say, on a spring and a damper and, uh, and uh, might have some mass, it might have some... Um, might have some so-called added mass due to the fluid going by or being around it, then, then it's, a, it's a kind of a case that you could compare acoustics, hydrodynamics, uh, linear piston theory, and uh, subsonic wing theory. So I'm going to do that in the next couple figures. Now the question is whether the medium surrounding that disc will provide added mass, added damping, and added stiffness. And that is, these are fluid contributed uh, causes to this uh, motion of this small disc. You can write the differential equation of motion as shown here, and the lowercase m, c, and k matrices are the mechanical physical stiffnesses that you or I would immediately see from the springs and so on. But the um, uppercase matrices M, C, and K are those contributions from the fluid. So an immediate question is, do you get these at all in a given fluid theory? But secondly, do they depend on frequency or velocity? And uh, I'm trying to set up a small table here to illustrate this. Now. Hydrodynamics, which you might call the, the father of all the fluid theories, uh, assumes that the speed of sound is infinite. And this C now is not the damping coefficient that I've used up above. It's not a matrix. It's just a scalar. Uh, you also assume that there's no fluid flow, that the fluid is stationary in our, in our particular problem here. I'm interested in just the uh, quiescent hydrodynamics here. And it turns out you do indeed get an added mass that's been calculated by many people. You can look in Lamb's books and so on. And often it's done by looking at the kinetic energy of the entire fluid field out to infinity and then finding uh, some kind of an effective mass of the fluid itself. But there is no damping matrix nor stiffness involved in hydrodynamic theory. Uh, and that means even when the body is doing these small oscillations. Now this is a... Um, uh, currently just a little flat disk. Now in acoustics, you um, assume again that we have quiescent fluid, that it's at zero velocity, and you do get um, a mass that de depends on frequency in this case. Uh, there's no need yet anyway to assume that speed of sound is infinite, so, so your frequency plays a role. There's a kind of damping called radiation damping, which means that for an unbounded region and with no reflection then of the outgoing waves, your energy can be carried away. So it's a special kind of damping. And you can get a stiffness associated to the uh, medium, and it depends on frequency. So this is a rather rich problem, it turns out. Subsonic wing theory, call it... Um, uh, thin wing theory would be much less than Mach 1, say Mach up to a couple hundred miles an hour. Uh, the one thing about slender wing theory, or sub, sorry, subsonic um, thin wing theory is that you can get vortices, and uh, these are what ultimately give you the lift. Now, you do get an effective mass, you do get damping, and you do get stiffness like quantities when you do uh, an oscillating wing type theory. Linear piston theory, you get Mach 2 to 5 range typically. Sometimes people will apply it a little bit lower, maybe down to 1 and a half. Turns out there is no mass effect, but there is quite a substantial damping. That's due to that unsteady term, the DWDT term, if the wall's moving. And you also get a stiffness like term, which is quite dominant and a non conservative type of stiffness that causes flutter. 
I think there's some viewers by now that are wondering, what the heck is this guy doing? He's uh, wandering off into other fields, and I wanted to find out when I talk how, whether my guy next to me can hear me or not. Um, it's just my general curiosity, and I'm I'm enough of a uh, newcomer to the field of acoustics that I'm I'm you know curious and interested in how this field fits into other uh, areas that I've seen. Let me do let me uh, press that uh, discussion for three more figures, just in a laundry list of comparisons here. And really, I've already spoken to some of these in the previous figure. Starting out, acoustics versus hydrodynamics. Uh, uh, what they have in common is that there are small disturbance theories and uh, there's no vorticity or lifting type uh, theory, at least for that stationary disk there. Uh, sorry, the disk that uh, in a uh, quiescent field of, of fluid. Uh, there's um, no damping in the fluid in this case for uh, either case. In other words, the fluid, the medium itself, doesn't internally have viscosity. Now we did get that radiation damping out of the acoustics, but that's an unusual thing. Um, and that's that's one of the special things to acoustics is you get the radiation damping out to the far far reaches of space. Um, that you can have compressibility in the acoustics problem, which would lead to a finite wave speed. Uh, you do get that the wave speed is constant, not a function of the frequency. Um, the thing that's special to hydrodynamics is that you get an incompressible uh, medium assumption and then you have infinite wave speeds. So things happen instantly and that's why it's uh, been a, a nice area in which to calculate added masses because thing hap things happen instantly throughout the whole space. Next we talk about acoustics versus subsonic wing theory. Common assumptions are both uh, small disturbances, and in both cases, there you can lose energy through damping mechanisms. Um, the thing about acoustics is that you can include the compressibility of the fluid. The finite wave speed is always true. The, uh, the but we don't get circulation in the acoustics theory uh, for these infinitesimal motions in a um, in a quiescent fluid, uh, and there's no damping per se in the uh, in the fluid itself. The wing theory is generally taken to be incompressible, and it can have circulations. Once you get that mean flow past that little disk, then it can shed uh, a vortex, uh, a hor hor typically called a horseshoe vortex, if it's a slender, um, if it's a, um, a wing that has quite a span in a disk. I don't know quite what what that vortex uh, shedding would look like. It might be kind of interesting anyway. But there would be this circulatory effect of the flow swirling like that. <coughs> Lastly, we have the comparison of acoustics and linear piston theory, which is a supersonic theory. Um, common assumptions given here, uh, small disturbances, uh, compressible fluid, finite wave speeds, no circulation in either case. So you don't get lift by circulation in the supersonic case. It's uh, by just pressure differences in, uh, among the surfaces. Um, in acoustics, where there's no damping in the fluid itself, even though you can have the radiation uh, energy loss. Uh, in piston theory, you have very localized effects, and there's no time delay. One thing about piston theory is the way that flow sweeps past a, a wavy wall is that uh, it only feels locally the pressure of that piston. So you've got a bunch of one-dimensional problems going from in a vertical sense as we drew the wavy wall. and. Um, and there's no time delays. You don't get uh, buildup of vortices and so on that uh, can affect what's going on upstream as you can in subsonic theories. So uh, it's kind of interesting to look at these different cases. And don't let them uh, confuse you. It's, it's, these aren't uh, really important for acoustics, except that you may also have seen some of these other fluid mechanics areas and, and wondered if there was any relation with acoustics. Now from this point on, we're going to go into uh, more of the theory of numerical acoustics, and um, we'll start out with a lot of classical ideas in the second lecture and then go on into the different uh, boundary elements and finite element versions. <laughs>